So welcome everybody. This is webinar number seven of the million dollar case study. I'm really stoked right now because we just put down the deposit this morning on our bamboo baby towels. So we selected a factory we like, I send them the money. It's always a little bit nerve wracking, right? To send a, a large sum of money to someone halfway around the world, but I'm confident that's gonna go smoothly. And this webinar is very timely because my uh, factory told me, hey, if you don't want any delays, I need your packaging design by Monday. And I said, you're gonna have to hold off because we haven't done session seven yet. <laughs> but um, on a serious note, we haven't done any designing yet. So. Um, I brought on Adam, one of the designers from Jungle Scout. Um, he's going to help us with this. I'm going to start by talking about some of the uh, legal and regulated, regulatory type stuff, and then he's going to help us um, figure out how to make sure this packaging looks good. So um, like I said, we, we've finished our negotiating with negotiations with the suppliers. We decided on our favorite. I sent the dis deposit. We used... Um, Alibaba trade insurance. So that's really nice because we're protected just in case anything goes wrong. And like I said, our sales reps asking for our packaging design, they need the design by Monday if we don't want to slow up the process. So the production process is going to take 30 days starting today. So we're going to go over the basics, the legal regulations, Amazon guidelines. Adam's going to fill us in on hiring and working with good designers, how to speak their language um, and make it look good. So where do we even begin? Okay, so we found a product, right? We, uh, we know what we want to sell. We found a factory. Now, a lot of people are thinking like, oh, crap, like what do I do for my packaging? I know that we want to private label these products, which means I want my own name on my own brand on this product. Um, you know, so like where do we go from here? So what I always do, what I recommend to other people is you work with your factory on the type of packaging that they're used to using. So, um, you know, if you're getting a water bottle manufactured and they're used to putting it in a box and all of a sudden you're asking them to put it in a, a bag, um, they're not quite used to, you know, that one wouldn't be a problem. That's probably not the best example, but maybe instead of ask them for like some strange like wooden box or something like that, that makes it complicated. It's not impossible to do it that way, but it makes it a lot harder. So I wouldn't recommend it. So I always work with the factory and say like, what type of packaging do you normally use for this product? For our last case study for the jungle sticks, they normally put it in a plastic bag. So we just put it in a bag and put a label on it. This factory, they um, when I asked them that, they either put it normally put it in a bag or put it in a box. I opted for the box because it's a higher end look, a higher end feel. And with our product, we're trying to go for like the high quality, high end look. So um, after I asked the factory that, you know, after I told them I wanted to go with the box as opposed to the bag, I asked them for a template. Okay. Um, and this is what they gave me. So this is their like standard or typical template for this particular product. And they gave this to me as a, a good starting point. So they said like, this is the size that it would need to be in order to fit your, um, remember we're doing a baby towel and a washcloth combo. They said that you don't necessarily have to use this size hole. You can change the size of the hole or remove it or do a different shape. Um, so that's kind of cool. That's something that we can play with. But um, this is a great start and, you know, we know that this is something that the factory is used to working with, which is really good. Uh, the other thing is there's lots and lots of different types of boxes and different types of box construction. I don't even know all of them. I have no idea what this style of construction is called, but if you can imagine the bottom of this box um, fits together kind of like a puzzle piece uh, in order to hold it together. Not all boxes are designed like that. So again, like if you want a box that's designed like in a different style and the factory is not used to that type of box or only really doesn't work with a factory that makes that style of box. You're just complicating things, uh, increasing the chance that there's some type of problem um, and something along those lines. So like I said, I, I really recommend working with the factory on what they're used to use, used to creating. All right. So now that we have, you know, we have a blank slate right here, like what the heck do we even put on this thing? All right. So there's different things to think about when you're designing your packaging. One is the uh, requirements. And a lot of these are like uh, legal requirements or Amazon regulatory requirements. So we need a barcode on our product. 
So I think everyone on here probably knows what a barcode is. There's different types, but a barcode is just used so a computer can scan it. Uh, so we need a barcode. We need the country of origin. That's a requirement to go through customs. So our particular products made in China. Again, as you guys can imagine, you see this on most of the packaging, you know, where it's made, if it's an import. Um, a requirement is we do name our brand name on this because we are private labeling it and brand registry, which we'll go over in a future webinar, but that's something inside of Amazon requires that your brand name's printed on your packaging. So that's a requirement, not even a nice to have. And then there's possibility that there's other certifications or um, guidelines that you need on your packaging. And this differs for different uh, types of products, different like categories. Um, and we'll go over this a little bit more in a future slide. So it's also nice to, for it to be visually appealing. Um, it's also good to have like company contact info on there. And it's good to have some a few other things. And again, we're going to go over all this in more depth in future slides. So, you know, like I said, and it may need other things, right? So like, how do you, I figure that out? Unfortunately, there is no great centralized resource to figure this stuff out. I would love it if the US government puts together a website and you could type in your the type of your product and it would tell you everything you have to have in your packaging. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist. So what I did is I Googled packaging requirements for towels, packaging requirements for baby towels, packaging requirements for baby products. Um, and look through those types of results to see if there's any types of like certifications. I'm talking about here like FDA or FCC or uh, UL, uh, any types of those things that my product would need to have and therefore I may need to show like a little stamp of approval type thing on our product. Another good space, uh, another good place to figure out if you need these types of um, certifications are to ask your supplier if they have like standard packaging that they normally use or if they're familiar with any um, kind of like legal requirements for the packaging, you can also ask an inspection company, even if you're not using them. Like I know the people at asiainspection.com, I've used them many times before. They're very friendly. So before you even place an order with them, you could just like sign up for an account and just ask them like, hey, um, you know, have you imported baby towels into the US before? Um, ha are there any inspections that you've done in the past? And then you can kind of like decide whether those things need to go on the packaging or not. Uh, you can look at your competitor's products, especially if it's like a large or like more legit brand, right? If Nike's selling this, they're going to be playing by the rules. They're going to, you know, have any of these like, um, these types of things on their packaging. And then just as like a general rule of thumb, dangerous or regulated or complex products are going to have a higher chance that you need this stuff. So if this is like a supplement that you eat, you digest, um, there's a good chance that, you know, that it's going to need these types of requirements, right? So that need like an FDA approval. Same thing if it's something that you eat off of or drink out of. Uh, same thing if it's a baby toy. I know there's regulations around that for like lead testing and things uh, along those lines. So all this is good to look into when you're uh, designing your packaging and planning for this. Along with, I'll call them like the legal package requirements, Amazon has some package requirements as well in order to be eligible for FBA, okay? So uh, you can just, if you want, you can just Google Amazon package requirements. I try to make a shortened link here because it's like a long, nasty URL. I don't know if this one's too much better, but you can type that in if you'd like. Um, these four that I've listed here, this is by no means an exhaustive list. They have quite a few of these, but this is one thing that Amazon has done well. They make it pretty clear what the package requirements are to be eligible for FBA. But these four that I grabbed here would be most relevant to our product or like the most common ones. So if your product is coming in a poly bag, assume that it needs a suffocation warning, okay? And if you can imagine, you know, like uh, clear plastic bags, they have this warning on them that says like, hey, kids can choke if they stick their head in this bag or whatever it says. Um, so they do require that if the opening is larger than a certain size. Pretty much any poly bag, just assume it needs a suffocation warning to be safe. If you really want, you can figure out what the opening is. Um, Amazon requires the FN SKU to be on the packaging. 
the only caveat there would be if you're using co-mingled inventory, but let's not even get into that because I hate co-mingled inventory. So just assume that all your products must have an FN SKU, which is Amazon's unique identifier barcode and no other barcode. So it can't have an FN SKU and a UPC or an FN SKU and the EAN, or it can't have the FN SKU and some other random barcode that UPS is using or whatever else. Okay. It can only have the FN SKU barcode. We'll cover this more in more detail later. I can't see the chat box, but I know it's filling up with questions around that because it's always uh, a, a popular topic. Um, for any type of fabric or plush item or baby item, the pack the packaging can't have an opening bigger than one inch by one inch. Okay, so this would be for like blankets. This would be for like a teddy bear. This would be for a um, even baby toys if they're hard. So like if you can imagine walking through like Walmart, you'll see like a baby toy that's like, let's pretend it's a dump truck, right? It has, and it will, it will only have cardboard on like two sides of it because, you know, when you're walking through Walmart, they want the kid to grab it and want to check out with it. Well, you can't send a baby product into Amazon with those big openings. And the reason for all of this is because in their warehouses, it may be dusty in there. It's probably not climate controlled. So it may be humid. So you don't want, um, to send in like a towel with no packaging around it because then it is open to those kinds of like conditions that aren't going to keep your products in good, uh, in good condition. So, uh, and if I were to generalize a lot of the other ones would be that your packaging needs to be durable. If you drop it on the ground from, let's say like a table height, it can't like break open. If it's a liquid, I think it has to have like a tape around the top so it can't come unscrewed. Um, there's a few other miscellaneous reg requirements like that, but that would be the gist of it, that it must be durable packaging. If it's like a glass, uh, uh, like a wine glass, um, it needs to be wrapped in bubble wrap, okay? So there's different like requirements like that. You can find all of them on Amazon's where, uh, website, see which ones apply to you, but these would be like the most common ones that I think affect the most amount of people. Like I said, Amazon does do a pretty good job of making it clear to us what they allow and don't allow on their website. Um, they even give you some of these nice little pictures. So, you know, like over here, this is what I'm talking about. You can't just send in like washcloths with just like this little ring around it for a wrap, right? That they don't allow that. The opening on this packaging would be bigger than one inch by one inch. So this would either need to be um, in a box or you have to put a bag around it. And as you can see, um, this bag does have the suffocation warning on it. It says warnings bags not a toy, blah, 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 blah. Your child will die if he swims in it. Um, <laughs> this other product over here, this is a baby toy. Again, same thing. Remember, like the baby toys can't be open. Um, they would have to be put in a bag as well. So keep these in mind. And these these aren't like US regulations. These are Amazon's requirements. So in order to use their FBA services, in order for them to store your product in their warehouse and fulfill it, you have to meet these guidelines. I'm not sure what would happen if you sent your products in without these guidelines. They'd probably either charge you to put them in bag. Actually, that is what they do. They charge you to like put them in bags. So it's best just to have your factory to do this because you can get this done a lot cheaper in China than you could um, by Amazon. But the reason I put all this in here is what's best if you're designing your package from the get-go. Just remember these things. You know why? If I'm designing this product. It, to sell on Amazon as my primary channel, why would I use this type of packaging that's just like this ring around the washcloths, right? That doesn't make sense. Instead, why don't we do a box that covers the whole thing or uh, just put it in a bag that covers the whole thing? That, you know, a packaging like that doesn't make sense if you're using Amazon as your primary channel. All right. This is a common question we get all the time. And I know people are really confused on this. Okay. So I'm going to do my best to clear this up once and for all, give this webinar to all your friends that ask this, um, every day in the Facebook groups. Okay. So why do we want, need to put the FN SKU on our product? There is an option at Amazon called stickerless commingled inventory, but I do not recommend it. And this is why with commingled inventory, you send in a product that just has a UPC barcode and it gets thrown into a pile of like the products that Amazon sourced and some other Joe Schmo uh, FBA seller sourced, uh, some that you sourced, and they just pick one and they just ship it to the customer, okay? So they don't know whether you mailed in that product or someone else. For private label sellers, this shouldn't matter too much. However, it's best just not to do this because as a private label seller, 
theoretically, there should never be anyone else selling on your listing. However, there are times that they can come in, um, that that can happen. And if someone else sends in a counterfeit item to your product and they use commingled, use commingled inventory, um, they could send out one of those counterfeit products to a customer and you could get in trouble for it because they don't know whose inventory is whose. They claim to only keep like one seller's inventory per warehouse or something like that. But I know sell, this has come, this has haunted a lot of sellers. So don't use st sticker list commingled. What's way easier is just print the FN SKU on your packaging. We're designing this packaging anyway. Why would we print the UPC on there, which would be like a universe, or I shouldn't say universal. I think that's just in the US, the UPC, but it would be like a, a barcode that's recognized through like Walmart and Target and whatever else. But we're not selling our product right now at Walmart. We're selling it on amazon.com. So we're just going to print the FN SKU. If our baby towel ends up landing a sweet deal with Walmart in a few months, we're going to do another production run anyway. So at that point, we'll just put the UPC on our packaging. Okay. So I don't, I don't know of any downside to just print the FN SKU on your packaging. That's what we're going to do. That's what I've always done. And that's what I really encourage all you guys to do. Now, again, I can't see the chat box, but I know this is what someone's probably saying right now. They're saying, Hey, you need an EAN or UPC to set up your listing. Yes, you do. You're correct. Okay. I purchased like a, a couple years ago, I purchased like 250 or something for, from speedybarcodes.com for like, I don't know, 20 or bucks or something. You can go there and you can just buy one or 10 or whatever, but you get UPC codes. Okay. These are co companies like speedybarcodes.com and there's a whole bunch of them. They're UPC resellers. So from my understanding how this works is there's some kind of like government organization um i think that's called gs1 that they like create these upc codes and they have them in a central database if you buy these in really bulk orders like a million at a time then you can get a really good deal if you're buying one i think it's like a few hundred bucks so it's kind of expensive if you're just buying one so what speedy barcodes and all these other companies have done they buy like a million at a time and then they resell them now, the problem with this is in that GS1 database, your company, so Greg's Baby Towels, isn't listed in the GS1 database as the owner of that UPC, okay? Speedybarcodes.com is. Now, Amazon does have a problem with this. They didn't used to, but now they do. They say, hey, if, you know, if that UPC is on your product, it needs to be registered in the GS1 database to the brand, you know, that's like on the packaging. So the way we're going to get around this is we're only going to use the UPC to set up our listing. After that, we're going to get our FN SKU. After we've gotten our FN SKU, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to create my product in my packaging. Once it's into Amazon, I'm going to register for brand registry right away. And I'm going to email Seller Central. I'm going to ask them to switch my unique identifier from the UPC to something like the model number. All right. So this is how you can get around um, this rule that Amazon does have now. So I'm just going to say this one more time because it's always confusing to people. And people say, hey, you know, now Amazon requires GS1. Yes, Amazon does require that the UPC is registered in the GS1 database if you're using the UPC as your identifier for your product. We're not. We're just using the FN SKU. And after we register for our brand, we're going to ask Amazon to delete that UPC from our listing and instead just associate the model number, which we can just make up because we're the brand. So Greg's baby towels, the model number for this one is just going to be hooded one. And I'm just going to say, hey, this no longer is this UPC associated with this product. Um, what did I just say? Hooded one is now the unique identifier for this product. All right. So hopefully that makes sense to everyone. And we've cleared this up kind of like once and for all. Um, so our next thing to figure out now is you know, like we saw earlier, we had this template, we need to fill it in. Um, so we need to get the, um, the FN SKU that I've been talking about from our Amazon account. So right now I'm inside my Amazon seller central account. All right. And I'm going to show you how to get the FN SKU out. So I'm under, if you go to inventory, uh, manage inventory up in the right, you can click on add a product. All right. Um, down here below the search, I can do create new product listing. Again, since this is my private label product, I'm creating a new listing. This doesn't exist on Amazon yet. This is a brand new product that I'm creating. And let me zoom in to make sure you guys can see this. 
I'm going to create a new product. Find your category. Uh, I'm going to type in baby towels. Now, you can change your category at a later date, but it is kind of a hassle because you have to email Seller Central. So I would recommend to try to get it right the first time. So let's see here. Baby bath towels is number two. Um, that looks like a good one for us. So I'm going to click it. I'm going to choose that one. And now it's asking us to set up our listing. Now we can change all this information at a later date. So it's not that big of a deal. Um, so I'm just going to put in some kind of, uh, bogus information right now. Um, manufacturer, we'll just say jungle creations and our brand name. Oh, I forgot to announce this earlier. Guys, we need help creating a brand name. So be thinking of them, or go ahead and put them in the chat box right now, and I'm gonna read some off in a few minutes, okay? Because we don't know what to call this brand. Um, our Jungle Sticks brand is just Jungle Sticks, which uh, that doesn't quite make sense for a baby hooded towel. Hopefully we have something that's a little bit nicer and friendlier sounding. So I have no idea what to call this thing, and I want you guys' help. So um, drop in the chat box what you think our brand name should be and for now i'm gonna name our brand drop in chat box because that's what i want you guys to do um and again like i said this can be changed later i'm just gonna say that um this right here is where it requires you to enter a, a upc or ean to set up a listing okay so um i just grabbed one right here that i'm going to use one second I'm just going to paste that in here. It does require you to fill out the rest of the stuff to create the listing, um, a towel, and said you can change this at a later date, so it's no big deal. So I just filled all that stuff in. If you have the real information, cool, go ahead and do that now. If not, you can kind of do bogus stuff and change it at a later date. I'm going to save that, and then I'm going to, this is the important part, I'm going to show you guys where to get the FN SKU to give to your, um, or to give to your designer to put on your packaging. All right. So hopefully this doesn't really take 30 minutes. It does not, which is good. Um, so this is the one, this is the one I just created right here. Um, I did this also yesterday as a test to make sure that uh, I remembered how to do it. But this is the top one that I just created a second ago. So the first thing you have to do is click uh, the drop down and change to change to fulfill by Amazon. That takes a second. This asks you what kind of barcode is going to be on your products. And the Amazon barcode, that's the FN SKU that we're talking about. The manufacturer barcode, that would be if you were putting the UPC on our packaging. But remember, I hate UPCs on packaging. I'm just using the FN SKU, which is the Amazon barcode. So that is what I'm going to do. So I click that. Uh, it tries to take me here, but I don't want to be here. So I'm just going to go back to manage inventory. And then on the product I just created, I'm going to select from the drop down. And let me see here. I guess it doesn't have this yet. I guess it takes a second. So I guess if this happens to you, just come back in like 30 minutes. What it should look like after the listing's done being created, you should have an option here that says print item labels. So I'm going to do that. I'm just going to click print here. And you'll see when I open this product, or this, uh, excuse me, PDF, that I have a barcode here. So let me, let me zoom in on this. This is my FN SKU. Um, Barcode, okay, and this is the FN SKU number. So this is the barcode. This is the exact barcode I'm going to put on my packaging. Underneath there, I'm also going to include this X00. Your FN SKU starts with the X00. All of them do. I don't have to put this baby hooded towel new, okay? So I'll just cut that off. So I would just, oh, I would just send this PDF to my designer, but just let them know you need to include the barcode and you need to include the numbers under or the the alphanumeric combination underneath because that's the FN SKU. So that's how you get this barcode out of your Seller Central account. You do have to create the listing first, and then, then you can get this. Um, at a later date, I'm going to go back. I'm going to edit that listing to make sure it's pretty and uses all my keywords and all that kind of jazz. But right now, my sole purpose for this is I just need to get this barcode so I can put it on my packaging. All right. So hopefully that is clear um, for everybody. And 
what we're going to do next here is I'm going to bring on um, Adam and he's going to talk to us a little bit more about packaging design. And let me just real quick, so I don't forget Adam, I'm just going to make myself the presenter um, so that to make sure that everyone can see my screen. Um, but just give Adam a quick introduction. Adam is a designer at Jungle Scout. He's primarily working on digital designs now, of course, because we're a software company, but he did cut his teeth in print and packaging design. So he's a tremendous resource. He knows a lot more than I do about this part of it. So um, with that being said, Adam, you want to uh, take it away? Sure. Thanks a lot, Greg. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, as Greg said, you know, working in the digital world now, but like most designers, uh, Got my start in the print world, you know, uh, in, in school, did like an internship, a really crazy print shop, doing everything from billboards to, you know, decals and book binding and all that stuff. So uh, it's really great to, you know, start in the print world, get my brain around all that stuff, uh, as most designers do. Um, and that's what we're here to talk about today is, is the world of print. Uh, the world of packaging, it's a crazy world out there. Um, you know, you look at companies like Apple spending tons of money to bring that big brand experience into every aspect of their offerings. You know, people are doing unboxing videos just to highlight the packaging. Um, you know, that's really a, a solid brand approach. You know, putting a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of brand into your packaging. Um, not exactly the approach we're going for uh, today. You know, during the case study, we've talked a lot about the strategy here, you know, looking at an existing market, existing demand, fulfilling it with a higher quality product. Um, but because we won't be stocking this product physically in stores and the brand itself is, uh, you know, probably a one off or something specifically for Amazon. Uh, you know, that brand experience can take a bit of a backseat in favor of utility, expediency, and, uh, and perhaps a, a cost reduction. So for today, we're going to keep things super simple. Uh, as Greg was saying earlier, we're going to focus on just working with our manufacturer and the types of packaging they usually work with. Um, you know, Greg got a great template there. That's kind of what we're shooting for is getting a template directly from them that then we can apply our artwork to and our legalese and our uh, FNSQ and all that stuff. Um, so let's assume at this point, uh, like we have here with the uh, uh, with the ongoing case study that we've, we found our manufacturer, we found our product, we're ready to take it to the next level. What do we do now? Um, so we're going to talk about, you know, communicating with the manufacturer. What exactly do you need in terms of a template? Um, we're going to go over some print design 101, just talking about printing specs, some of the different methods of printing that uh, your package printer may use or your manufacturer may use. We'll talk about some layout and design stuff at a really high level, um, mostly uh, the aim here is just to give you the tools to communicate effectively with your manufacturer or printer as well as your designer, uh, being able to identify, you know, quote unquote, good design versus bad design. We'll talk about some do's and don'ts that you can uh, embrace or avoid. And then we'll wrap it all up with uh, how to source a graphic or package designer, uh, what you can expect from them as a final output and then how you can get that to your manufacturer or printer and uh, be on your way. So if we can just go to the, the next slide there, Greg. Uh, as we said before, you know, working with your manufacturer is the best option. Um, you know, most manufacturers, they've got a variety of options, like Greg said, you know, for the baby towels, you have the option of using the bag or a box. You can choose the box as kind of a higher end thing. Uh, I think in the die line they provided there, it even had like uh, the option for a little window to see a little bit of the fabric, you know, 
we'll have to keep that as a one by one as instructed by Amazon, but they, they do have some good options there. Um, not quite as crazy as, you know, the Apple iPhone, you know, you're probably not going to make an unboxing video for the baby tail, uh, but for our purposes, the best option, you know, you're reducing your variables, reducing your headaches, streamlining the effectiveness, uh, and likely reducing your cost as well. So a good template will include um, the size with a bleed. So we'll talk about what a bleed is exactly. Uh, the printing specs, which we'll get into a little bit more, as well as the color process, and if necessary, a dye line. Uh, so here is a whole bunch of print world jargon, uh, which I'm going to demystify for you now. So the first is uh, resolution. Um, so when people think we're at resolution, usually we're more familiar with the digital world, talking about pixels, you know, tiny little specks of light or color on screens, our phones. Um, the world of print is not so different, except we use dots of ink. Uh, so instead of little pixels everywhere in your, you know, like your TV is 1080 by 1920 pixels or something like this, uh, we use DPI, so that's dot per inch. Um, so generally 300 DPI is the standard here. So this is what, you know, if you have final artwork that is not vector, like it's a photograph or something like this for some reason, uh, you really want to make sure you're hitting that 300 DPI. You can get away with 150 or, you know, 200 or something, but really 300 is, is the best practice we're going for here. Um, if you don't and you go with you know, the screen resolution, uh, you get the kind of pixelated guy on the left there. Um, so we're going for the good boy, uh, 300 DPI. Um, and just a note on that too, really, it, it unless you're using photography, this should be uh, irrelevant. Uh, hopefully your designer is sticking to vectors, which is a size and resolution independent image. Um, it's a math thing, I won't get into explaining it, but essentially it just looks great at any size. Um, so that's something you can include in your request uh, to your designer, which we'll get into at the very end, is, is to request an all vector uh, design. So then the next thing we're talking about print design and, and print process here is the bleed. So. Oftentimes people will, will request a bleed or they'll say there needs to be a bleed. This did a, just a bit more jargon. Really what it means is they want the image you're putting on your packaging or on anything else to have some overflow. And the reason for this is that it's very hard for the machines to get the ink right to the edge. So what they do instead is they print past where the edge is going to be and then they just cut off a bunch of it. So you'll see here, and, and likely on your template, this will be included, uh, but there'll be a, a trim line where everything beyond the trim line just gets cut away, and then your final artwork sits inside those trim lines. Um, so you want to make sure that uh, if you have photography or artwork or something that's going to be using a bleed, that all your pertinent information is safely inside that zone, you know, this little pup's ear isn't getting cut off or the words, you know, the, the name of your product or something isn't going to get cut in half. Uh, so you just want to make sure everything is, is safely inside that final artwork zone because the stuff beyond is, is going to get cut off. The next thing um, we wanted to talk about was dye lines. And uh, Greg showed a great uh, template earlier straight from his manufacturer of uh, the dye line for his uh, baby towel box. So a dye line, essentially you can just think of this as like a cookie cutter. So when when the cardboard goes down the, down the conveyor belt in the processing line, this cookie cutter comes down and it cuts it into the shape of the box flat. And then another one will come down and it'll kind of depress the uh, the cardboard in the areas that will be folded. So it, you know, kind of creases it, but it doesn't cut it. And um, to do so, they need to actually build this cookie cutter. So if they provide you a die line and you want to say to them, 
you know, this is great, but I'd prefer it if it was a hexagon instead of a square. Um, they'll actually have to re, they'll have to make a new cookie cutter. They'll actually have to make that out of metal if they don't have one on hand. So deviating from their existing die lines is generally not a good idea. It'll increase the cost, increase the variables. You kind of want to stick to what they have. And similarly with the bleed, um, there's parts here that are going to get cut off. There's parts here that are going to get folded. You can see uh, where the side panels are, where the top panel is, where the back panel is. And you want to make sure your artwork is safely within those cut lines and fold lines, uh, as well as, you know, any of your text information. Like often you'll see on a cereal box or something, they'll have that nutritional information on the side panel. You know, you want to make sure the side panels, you know, don't have so much space. So you want to make sure you're uh, not too close to the edges there where things are going to get folded. But then you can see once it's cut out, it just gets folded into your final box. Uh, and likely they'll um, give you, you know, in the case of, of Greg's template, they give you all the measurements there of how many inches each, you know, little section is and uh, where the bleed is for each little section. So usually they're really good about giving you all that information you want. Uh, so once the box is cut and ready to go, they're going to print um, the image onto it, or they might even print it on before they cut it. Uh, so let's talk a bit about color and printing methods here. So basically when it comes to package printing and, and really most large scale printing, you, you've got two options, which is digital. This is the same as your printer at home or the office, basically. Uh, it's using a um, four color process, CMYK, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And it's basically just mixing those colors to create any color you could possibly need. Um, it does, you don't get charged for having lots of colors versus, um, you know, fewer colors, it's it's kind of the same all around. Uh, and then there's offset and flexographic printing, which is, I mean, it, it gets pretty technical, but basically you can just think of these, that they're kind of like a stamp. So the th your product or package will go down the line and these things will stamp the color onto the, onto the box. And the offset is the same as a stamp you would use at home. You know, it, uh, the ink sits on the raised part of the stamp and then it gets, you know, transferred onto the paper. Whereas flexographic is basically the opposite where the, the ink sits inside the depressed part of the stamp and in that way is, is transferred to the paper. Um, so, so these guys will use CMYK as well. So you can achieve most colors this way. Um, but if you want to have two variations of the same color, then you actually need to add another, what they call spot color. And this is where you get into Pantones, where they're going to ask you for a specific color number. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, they have actually, you know, just like a stamp you use at home, they've got trays of ink that these stamps go into. So if you've got one color of you know green, that's fine. But if you've got two colors of green, they actually need two trays of ink to hold those two different colors. They can't they can't just mix them. So uh, the cost there can get uh, a little higher. Um, flexographic or offsets really good for large volume printing. Uh, it's more consistent color. Uh, it's, it's a nicer quality thing at the end of the day, but it does take much longer to set up. And uh, the price is quite a bit higher generally, unless you're printing in a very mass quantity, in which case it's actually quite a bit lower than digital. My guess is that for our needs and your products, everything's going to be digital. So um, that's going to be the easiest for your designer to achieve. But again, before you contact the designer, you're going to want to make sure you get all these specs from the manufacturer, from the printer, and pass them on to the designer. Because uh, designing for digital versus designing for offset or flex is actually quite different. 
Um, so you want to make sure they have the information they need to design something that can be achieved with the tools that your printer has at hand. Um, you know, there's a thousand other things we could go over in the world of uh, printing packaging. We can talk about embossing stuff or debossing, uh, you know, foils and holograms, <laughs> hundreds of types of paper stock and finishes. Um, but if you find yourself getting into all that with your manufacturer, you're probably going overboard, uh, losing focus. Um, so let's just keep it simple. And really the only thing you're, you're going to need about for, or need to worry about is the resolution, the bleed and the color. And then if necessary, if you're not just doing a bag or something, uh, or, or a label, then, uh, perhaps the dye line, but that'll be enough to keep you safe and printing effectively. Um, again, the most important part of this whole print process is that you get this information from your manufacturer and you pass it along to the designer before they start designing anything. Uh, a good designer's job is to kind of color within the lines of the specs provided. So be sure that you give him or her the limits and then that's going to keep you avoiding extra charges and headaches um, from your packaging producer. So now that we know kind of how things are going to get printed, let's talk about what's going to get printed. Um, you know, <laughs> talking about layout and hierarchy, this is kind of getting into the fundamentals of graphic design here. So I wouldn't recommend that you design your own packaging unless you're already a graphic designer working in print. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of the jack of all trades, master of none thing, right? It's, it's always better, faster, uh, and probably at the end of the day cheaper to just hire a professional, get it done right the first time. Um, but it is super important, obviously, for you to be able to communicate with this person and for you to also be able to un uh, identify what is, you know, good layout versus poor layout. You know, what is a good looking design versus a poor one outside of just, you know, I like this or I don't like this. So when we're talking about layout, and hierarchy of basically anything, uh, especially in the print world, basically all works the same as like a magazine cover might work. So you got the most important pertinent information at the top. It's generally quite a bit bigger. Uh, this can be the, the title or the name of the product, the name of the company providing the product. And then following that, you've got supplementary or specific information um, uh, uh, supplementary graphics kind of backing up what the product is or the brand. And then the least important stuff is, is right at the body and that's your legal or right at the bottom. Sorry. And that's your legal copy, whatever kind of required, you know, you've got the UPC symbol on the magazine there. Um, all that stuff can kind of go on the bottom or on the back of the box. Um, and you keep the really important stuff in the important areas. So you can see how this can of, of hardy cuts here has used basically the exact same hierarchy as the magazine. You know, you've, you've got the company and the name of the product right up at top, taking two thirds of the space. Then you've got some supplementary information about it being grain free and it's the turkey and duck recipe. It looks delicious with that photograph there. And then at the bottom, You've got that um, kind of least important but legally required information, like how many grams of hardy cuts are in the can and, and all that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, when it comes to layout, uh, just the last thing is that, you know, good designs sometimes look kind of crazy and experimental and it's kind of fun to look at. But we're focused on utility here. Unless you have a crazy experimental product, it's definitely better to keep to the basics. Um, and a good designer will know, you know, what those are, and, and now so do you. Uh, so before we talk about sourcing a good designer, let's talk on some designs, design do and don'ts here really quick. Um, and this is going to help you select a designer or designers in this process or, or sorry, I should say it'll help you select a designer or a design in this process as uh, you might get multiple designs and you're trying to figure out which one's the best one. 
So I'm not gonna go too deep into the why or the why nots or the philosophy behind these points, but I promise if you stick to this, uh, you'll be doing well in terms of visual design. So you do wanna keep it simple, you know, and when I say that, I mean, you know, not have a lot of stuff going on. You don't need a lot of crazy pictures and, and illustrations and explosions going on. You can just keep it simple to the information and maybe one supporting graphic if necessary. It might not even be necessary. Don't use, you know, it, it, and then, you know, in the vein of keeping it simple, try not to use more than two fonts or typefaces. Uh, it just makes it harder to read. It's kind of uh, just a best practice. Um, do keep the palette minimal, uh, the color palette, especially for offset or flex printing, like we talked about earlier, the more colors you have for offset, the more cost, the more trays of ink they're going to have to lay out. Um, so definitely try and keep it to a minimal palette of your brand colors or just one or two colors you choose. Don't put unnecessary information or imagery on the box but do use the package as an opportunity to add value. So this is a great thing you should keep in mind is that if you've got like a funky kitchen gadget or something, you can put a little recipe on there or maybe a novel way to use it. If you've got one of those, uh, you know, silicone ice cube trays or something, maybe you put a little recipe about how to make cool orange juice ice cubes or whatever, you know, some novel way to use your gadget. Uh, you can put your instructions on there. That's a great thing to also do. That saves paper. It saves you from having to also print out an instruction book or something and put it inside. Uh, you know, from the previous case study with the jungle sticks, we put a cool little s'mores recipe on there. You know, any, any way you can kind of add a little bit of value. Um, likely it's not going to uh, increase the cost of your package printing. So you're kind of adding a little something for the customer without increasing your cost, which is always a great thing. Um, and again, don't, you know, don't try and design your own package unless you're a designer. Uh, you can, but uh, you're probably going to end up making more headaches for yourself just in terms of getting the specs right or um, that type of thing. So do try and hire, hire a designer for this. And, and we can talk some more about that now. So when it comes to sourcing a designer, there's there's so many options out there. You can go to something like Upwork or Design Crowd if you're looking for you know a, a very professional, um, probably higher cost solution. Um, if you're looking for uh, a more price reasonable solution, uh, you know Fiverr or 99designs is a great way to go. If you're super price sensitive, you know Fiverr is a great option. There's lots of good uh, designers in the community out there that can uh, give you what you need on a pretty rapid turnaround at a, at a pretty reasonable price. Um, for you know, for my opinion, 99designs gives you the most bang for the buck. Uh, so I just want to talk about them really quickly. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't work for them. <laughs> we don't have any association. I've just used them in the past and uh, and have always got great work. So uh, some benefits of using these guys is that they have a real active community. Uh, you, you Basically how it works is you uh, create a submission. You, you say kind of what you want. You let them know what information needs to be on the package. You give them the specs. In this case, you can just straight up give them the template. And then what will happen is you'll get a whole bunch of designs, like a dozen designs or more um, for one price. And they also have a whole bunch of packaging specific plans. So you can actually, um, you know, submit this in the category of product label or product physical package like your like the cardboard box as an example for the baby towels or if it's a you know some some type of bottle of body lotion or something you know um, they, they have basically a different product design tier for every type of product beauty products whatever so you can get really specific and get designers that specialize in that um, uh, like I said before, great bang for the buck. Uh, they have different tiers of pricing, but it starts super reasonable. Um, 
And, and my favorite part about it, uh, if you're not used to looking at design portfolios, um, there's no need to do it. You just submit and a whole bunch of designers come out of the woodwork, make great options for you to choose from, and you can just choose one. Um, on a lot of the other uh, options out there in the world, uh, you have to kind of dig through all these portfolios, contact the designer directly. You know, what they give you is kind of what you get. There's generally a lot of back and forth. So this way, you just get a whole bunch of options and, and you can kind of choose from that. So uh, easy, I would, I would go for that. Uh, and then finally, you know, it's, it seems like a lot of stuff to think about. It might seem, you know, like all aspects of this, you know, you can, um, you can get into the details forever, but really just work with your manufacturer and their in-house packaging options. Get the template from them first off, get the specs from them. Uh, so you know, you know what you're gonna need to do to create a package that works with how they work. Uh, so decide on and assemble your packaging info. This is likely just going to be, you know, for the, the case of the baby towels, um, the name of the brand, the name of the product, maybe the quantity. Uh, you might want to have some copy on there about the materials used, maybe a little paragraph on the back of the box about why it's so awesome. Uh, you bring that all together with your, you know, FNSQ and the other thing. Uh, and you can find a designer or submit to 99designs, give them that little package of information. They're gonna do some awesome work for you. Uh, you can select a final, send it off to your manufacturer, and then they'll probably uh, give you the option of you know the first package that comes off the print line, they'll send to you, uh, and you can approve it. You can kind of inspect it for yourself. Uh, this takes a bit of time, obviously, because they've got to ship it to you and then you've got to get back to them. Um, a much more time uh, saving method is get them to just take a whole bunch of pictures of it. Uh, generally, that's good enough. But once you've done that, you're done. You're good to go. So and that's, uh, um, that's it. Thanks a lot for that, Adam. That's exactly what my uh, manufacturer just asked me after I put down my deposit was, um, do you want do you need me to mail you, you know, like the proof of the packaging or can I just take a bunch of photos of it and send it to you? And I said, you can just send me uh, a bunch of photos and that's um, good enough. So I'm going to go ahead and read a few of the, um, of the brand names you guys put in here. We see we have baby panda towels, plush towels, jungle critters, baby panda bamboo, jungle seed, Stop me if you hear a good one, Adam. Jungle Bee, Jungle Critters, Jungle Baby Towels, uh, Happy Tubby, Jungle Snugs, <laughs> Plush Baby, Jungle oh, Cuddles. Jungle Snugs. I like Jungle Snugs. Jungle Snugs? Yeah, yeah that's that not good. bad. Yeah. Um, jungle Cuddles. That sounds kind of like inviting, warm and soft yeah. and nice. Um Jungle Cubs, Jungle Hoods Are Us, that may be some trademark infringement <laughs> on Toys R Us, right, Babies Are Us. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, is your designer in China? No. Guys, just to clarify here, you normally uh, you bring your own designer, get like your designer, that part of it done separately from the factories. Like the factory doesn't supply this designer, just to be clear there. They normally provide the template and then it's up to you to uh, color in the lines, if you want to say. Um, jungle Baby Bear Towels, um, Jungle Care, a lot of jungle stuff, guys. We could do a scout something, you know, scout towels. Yeah. Uh, cutie Little Jungle, Jungle Babies. I have to say, guys, I don't know if I've, I've, I've found the one yet. I'm going to do a little more thinking of this, though. Um, next week is when we will be doing our uh, freight forwarding webinar. Um, we're bringing on a freight forwarder from uh, Freightos, and he is going to talk to us about all things shipping and freight. So I have a favor to ask you guys. By now, we're at session seven of the Million Dollar Case Study. Hopefully, you've gotten lots of value out of this. On our YouTube channel, we're almost to 20,000 subscribers. If everyone on 
this webinar right now, clicks through to YouTube and hits the subscribe button on our YouTube channel. We'll go over 20,000, which will make my night. I would love you for that more than anything else. So before you forget, go ahead and click our YouTube link, click the subscribe button, and I'll love you forever for it. Um, and with that being said, I think, um, I think that wraps it up. So we will see you next Wednesday at noon for our freight forwarding webinar. And I look forward to uh, chatting with you guys again soon. So take care. Bye.